and welcome everyone to I'm for the Arts next Wednesday webinar. My name is Shabnam Pelesa Mohammed from the I4TA's Interim Steering Committee and joining us with technical production tonight is my colleague Yvette Hardy from Asitej. Tonight we're delighted to host some of South Africa's most talented, often controversial political cartoonists in an insightful, a courageous, a fun and an interactive event. If you don't have paper, pen or a pencil by now, now is your time to get it and maybe explore your skills. You could be South Africa's next political cartooning talent. If you think South Africa's political cartooning talent is restricted only to the fantastic cartoonists that you will be seeing on your screen during this live video, let's tell you how many uh, people are interested in cartooning in our country. So there's a website and a Facebook page called Afri-Cartoons on Facebook. Established 12 years ago on Nelson Mandela's 90th birthday, with an archive of 25,000 cartoons, the largest collection of online cartoons by mostly South Africa's top cartoonists, with a following of over 1.2 million people on Facebook, the largest of its kind on the platform, also nurturing emerging talent with a rotating weekly gig in the Daily Mavericks, Mavericks Citizen Supplement. We love our cartoons. So what I want to do now is introduce you to our panel. Of course, we're in conversation with Zapiro, the editorial cartoonist for the Daily Maverick. He published 24 best-selling cartoon annuals. Welcome, Zapiro, to the conversation. We're also welcoming Nanda Subban, who is a political cartoonist, artist, animator, author, and founder of the Center for Fine Art, Animation, and Design. We're in conversation with Bethwell Mangena, a cartoonist and a graphic artist at African News Agency and the Sunday Independent. We're in conversation with Stacey Stent, animator and Noseweek cartoonist who listens to conversation. And we're in conversation with Carlos Amato, editorial cartoonist for the Mail and Guardian and the New Frame. Cartoonist, welcome to this I'm for the Arts webinar. <laughs> It's wonderful to have you on our topic for this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. Well, before I introduce it, a quick shout out to our Black Lives Matter colleagues watching us all the way from Minneapolis. The struggle continues and South Africa stands in solidarity with you. Our topic today, cartoonists drawing the line on democracy, corruption and lockdown. And a question for our audience, why do South Africans find cartoon art a powerful and often very funny form of journalism? All right, we're ready to rumble in a rapid fire session. Uh, so let's get straight into it. But remember first to share the live video you're seeing on the I'm for the Arts group as a watch party <laughs> to your profiles, your groups and your pages. So everyone who loves cartoonist creativity and thinking can join in the conversation. Let's bring it up uh, to the first question for this evening. And we're going to go in order of the event post that you would have seen online. Here's the first question. Why cartooning, Zapiro? What inspired or provoked this journey? Well, I think probably all of us are going to say that we've always wanted to be a cartoonist. And, and I'm certainly one of those. So that's what I wanted to be from when I was a kid. Uh, but then I lost confidence. Um, because during apartheid, I found it difficult to know how to be a cartoonist. I, I, I didn't really know what to do. I went, I had to avoid the <laughs> army. I went to study architecture. While doing architecture, I, re I again realized I, I was actually crap at architecture. And I really wanted to be a cartoonist. I went traveling. Um, I was wanting to get politically involved. I went to meet some famous cartoonists in Europe. Uh, I, I, not, I rang Uda Zo, the artist of Asterix, I rang his doorbell at 11 o'clock at night in Paris in my desperate, you know, I got lost in Paris and, I, and, and he, he let me in, can you believe, at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it's, it's so, you know, that generosity and the, th the things he told me about cartooning and all that, I thought I'm, I've got to do it. When I came back, I left architect, I got conscripted into the army because of that because they said I changed courses. And uh, then I refused to carry a gun and that turned me into what I considered a kind of a walking <laughs> cartoon. And I decided then and there that I wouldn't study anymore. I would become a cartoonist and I would also really bring the cartoons and the politics together. So that, that, that's my story. 
that's your story and it's a good one. I remember a couple of years ago interviewing you for the Daily News and you telling me this lovely story about how you look like a low-flying Nazi. <laughs> that was a lovely story. All right, Nanda Suman, why cartooning? What inspired or provoked this journey? It didn't inspire me, it provoked me. Um, I'm a fine artist and I use my cartoons. I, cartoons is just a way of expressing myself to using my art is we live that life where we are to be, we were forced to move and things like that, where we're, we're not allowed to go to the toilets in the city and play a sport with other people. And that inspired me. Well, I'm saying inspired. It provoked me into becoming a cartoonist. So for you, it was your experience of apartheid and you needing to express yourself and uh, and being able to do that by starting drawing uh, with, with chalk on walls, I believe, and then progressing into becoming uh, one of our best known cartoonists in our country. Let's move from there to Bethwell. Bethwell, tell us, what inspired or provoked your cartooning journey? <laughs> Uh, for me, I always loved to draw when I was young, and um, uh, we, I remember we used to uh, draw um, uh, 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 murals for liquor stores just to make money for lunch, and also at school we used to draw um, Mickey Mouse cartoons on uh, people's uh, school. We, I remember we used to, uh, and also at school we used to draw school. We, uh, we, I remember we used to, uh, draw at school we used to draw um, a drawing but education. Uh, lost uh, well a little and, bit there, and that's when I about... saw from family, I discovered cartoons. So, uh, drawing education until I went to do fine arts. Yeah, when I went to do fine arts, and then that's when I discovered, and then that's when I yeah, when I went to the arts, and then that's when I discovered cartoons, I draw in other famous cartoonists. And then I started to in making at school. And then I decided to um, see that I can make a career out of this, you know. And Sunday World gave me uh, cartoons in uh, a break after a couple of years. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Bethwell, I think your camera is off your video. If you want to just turn it on. Um, me, uh, if the network uh, bothers you, then you can put it and just and use the audio. Right. All right, let's talk to Stacy Sten. Stacy, this is an interesting question for you. Why cartoon okay, let me check inspired that. or provoked this journey? Because you're literally the only female cartoonist on this panel. So I'm very curious. <laughs> Yeah, it keeps happening. Um, I, I actually was like, like Nanda. I was I was also considered myself a fine artist and a painter, but um, with uh, you know cartooning always interested me. Yeah, you know, when I was little, I used to do a lot of cartooning for my mother and things. But um, I just remember having this revelation that during the apartheid years, there was some fantastic cartooning going around but everybody was parodying the government. And I thought, you know, there's other stuff going along that, uh, around that you can parody other than, the, other than the government. And mostly people, you know, conversations that I hear, people that sort of would inflate themselves or the people that wanted to, you know, they live very comfortable lives, but they considered themselves socialists. And I started actually listen, that's why I say conversations. I started listening to conversations and I thought, well, I can draw. <coughs> And uh, and let me take the gap. So I took the gap. Unfortunately, my family were um, often the source of my inspiration. And but some friends. So sometimes pub, uh, people would get upset because sometimes you just get one in the hand. You know, you just hear a yeah. conversation or you'd be part of a conversation, and uh, it, suddenly it would be a cartoon. And then you know, and then also sometimes friends would come to me and say, you know, you could at least tell me when you're going to do a cartoon about me. And I'd say, actually, it wasn't you, it was somebody else. <laughs> and, you know, so there were a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of similarities in that kind of stream. And I was right. part of it, I parodied myself as well. Mm -hmm. Very important to do, to be able to parody yourself. Carlos, tell us, why cartooning? What inspired or provoked this journey? I was um, 
drawing as a youngster a lot and uh, sent off a cartoon to a, a short-lived uh, magazine, I think called Laughing Stock in uh, 1988 or so, and uh, got a, a rejection letter, which was very generous and very sweet. Um, you know, the editors were like, wanted to encourage me and, and said no, but said, keep at it. And I did. Um, but I became a writer uh, for many years. I um, studied literature, did a postgrad degree in animation, and then got into newspapers. So I spent about 10 years as a football writer, a culture writer, and eventually a news writer and an editor, and got burnout and decided I didn't want to write a damn thing anymore, or at least I didn't want to write for newspapers. Um, yep. And quit and tried to write children's books, which I'm still trying to do. Um, but then an opening opened up at uh, Manor Garden when Zapira left and, and I, I just tried my luck and mm -hmm. I was really raw, but um, I got the job and that was a huge, a huge breakthrough. And ever since, I mean, that was four years ago, uh, I've been learning on the job and, and suddenly doing the thing which I dreamed of doing as a kid, which was a huge shock and just wonderful. So it yeah. Is. It is absolutely around. inspiring. I hope that the young cartoonists watching this panel, you're equally inspired by the journeys of all these cartoonists that started somewhere. Okay, next question. Career highlights. You can share with us and highlight from your career, either one that's really good, one that's really bad, or one that's completely crazy, right? Share one with us. Zapiro, let's start with you. Oh, gee, Are you, now you're limiting us. I thought we had to do like one of each. Oh, anyway, okay. Well, you can try, you can try. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you a highlight. I can't really beat getting an honorary doctorate with Nelson Mandela um, when he got an honorary doctorate. Uh, that's sort of crazy. Um, the, the, the two things were split in, in time because it ended up that he that he had already told, his foundation had already told uh, all the universities that he would no longer be appearing in person. He was kind of you know, pre-lockdown lockdown because he'd already had about 320 uh, honorary doctorates. So they ended up going to his, to his home. So I got my honorary doctorate and then went to Nelson Mandela's home. In, in fact, the other way around, I went first to his home where he got his doctorate and then they asked me to come up and, and present him with a drawing that I had for him. I actually had two drawings for him, one from the Sowetan, where I, the newspaper I was working, one of the three newspapers I was working for at the time, and one from me. So that was an unbelievable highlight. Um, and then, then uh, getting the Principal Prince Class Award, which is sort of like, it's kind of one of the sort of Oscars of the cultural world uh, yep. in, in the Netherlands in 2005. Uh, I can hardly beat that as well. Can I tell you a crazy a bad one? Seeing yes. my name in big letters on the front of a newspaper saying that uh, th this bunch of crazy characters, I won't go into the details now, want to assassinate me uh, mm. using either uh, small small arms, poison or explosives. So, you know, I've, I've had a lot of stuff happen to me, believe me. Mm, mm, mm. A lot of people think cartoonists are just fun and games, but it's a dangerous uh, career that you chose and you guys know this. Nanda Subban, share with us something from your career, a highlight, good, bad or crazy? I mean, the bad ones are the good ones. I like uh, the good ones. Um, I had to get an amnesty award from the at the Mother First Council in San Francisco. Um, I painted a mural at the Ed Summit in, in Brazil, Eco 92. Um, I can't remember what else. The Editing Award. Um, and what about, what sure. about the threats? I mean, I'm sure there have been, a, there've been quite a few threats, but uh, we're going to get to that at some point if you don't want to talk about it now. I did, I did receive an award from uh, Andy Pelosi, US Congressional Award. I'm not sure what else. There's quite yeah. a few. All right, let's uh, let's move on to Bethwell. Share with us, Bethwell, from your career, uh, a good, a bad, a crazy, a highlight that you want to share with our audience today. For me, uh, my best moment was uh, uh, this day I received a call from Ottoman and they said they wanted a cartoon that I did 
of him and Nelson Mandela. They just lost their son from HIV AIDS. So I go home, I look at the cartoon and it looked a bit. So a few weeks later, I was shocked to read in the Sunday Times that uh, Mr. Butele actually gave the other cartoon to Nelson Mandela. And they said they wanted, so that's the greatest moment. Of, so I decided to do the exact. So I go home, I look at it. So a few weeks later, so that's the Absolutely brilliant. Victor, your camera is still off. Try to switch it on so we can see you. But meanwhile, <laughs> let's let us move over on to, to Stacy. Stacy, your career highlights, good, bad, or crazy. Well, the, the, the good is so short that um, I think Stacy is frozen there. We're using this lovely technology. It doesn't always work. We'll give her a second to recover. And let's move to Carlos. Carlos, career highlights, good, bad, or crazy? Um. Really short career so far, so, so my highlights is a bit more modest than, than my eldest' highlights, but um, I was uh, retweeted by Stephen Fry, which was, which was a pleasure, um, but uh, I happened not to have signed the cartoon that he retweeted, so he just said, I don't know who to credit this for, but excellent work. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, uh, in the good books of Stephen Fry, so I might put that on the uh, on my obituary, excellent work, Stephen Fry. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's one of the things we keep saying to our students, please remember to sign all of your work. Somebody amazing might see it and they'll never know who to credit it to, but it's a good lesson. Learned. I think yeah. Stacy is still frozen there. Maybe we'll come back to her on that one. But here's a question that uh, a lot of people are asking and uh, we've got a question here from Ismail Mohammed. Let's take this one first. And he says, Patrick Blauer of the Daily Telegraph said his paper drew the line at any depiction of physical violence towards Theresa May, presumably on the grounds that it strays too close to domestic violence against women. Um, in retrospect, then how does Zapiro feel about his rape cartoon series? That's one for you, Zap. <laughs> Um, I think that uh, there, there are conventions in cartooning that are um, that are very much about th that I, well, I think have been sort of reinterpreted uh, more recently about kind of punching punching up rather than punching down. If there were any uh, that, that 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 would be number one, and this, the other thing would be about the the use of of, of metaphor. Now I, I'm not going to say that metaphor is that every single metaphor is always okay but I think that this metaphor was perfectly intelligible as a metaphor uh, about a politician who was um, who abusing an institution with the help of his political accomplices and it was labeled as such and I don't think that there's I, I find it very hard to uh, to feel that it overstepped the mark. Uh, in fact, I think that any empathy would be felt for the, the um, well, in the in this instance, the victim of that. You could call it a, a rape survivor. You, call it a, a rape, you wouldn't say a rape victim, but in the cartoon, the victim of this abuse, uh, or hopefully the survivor of it, ultimately. Uh, is some is a metaphor and labeled as such and the human the human rights commission was actually there was a complaint and they exonerated me completely on the on on all grounds uh jacob zuma also sued me um i've also had many many conversations i was much more interested in how women would receive the cartoon and there were even rape survivors and and even gang rape survivors who understood the political message i'm not saying that all women accepted it, not at all, and the, the debate is still open, um, but I, I feel I will defend that cartoon. Yeah. Good question there from Ismail Mohammed, and an interesting response from Zapiro. Let's talk about this question. It's come up in our interim steering committee. What is the role of a political cartoonist anywhere in the world? Uh, and we'll start with you, Zap, just so we keep the order going. What's the role of a political cartoonist anyway? 
I think cartoonists generally are trying to get people to read between the lines. So not accept things at face value, um, whether it's a, something a politician has said, uh, an advertiser, a corporate, um, uh, that, that's the thing. We're always looking to say, uh, to see where is the hypocrisy? Where's the difference between what they were saying yesterday and what they're saying today or between their, what they're saying and their, and their actions? Um, and we, we're knocking people off their pedestals, especially the powerful, as I said earlier, punching up. Uh, I don't think there are good cartoonists who are trying to punch down, who are trying to stereotype a whole group of people. What we're trying to do is we tend to go for the powerful, speak for the underdog. Uh, and I think good cartoonists also try and, um, and fight against uh, things like um, racism, things like uh, gender, uh, gender <coughs> abuse, that sort of thing, uh, homophobia. Of course, there are right-wing cartoonists and some of them are quite good. Uh, not that many, but, but I think many of us are actually sort of progressive at heart. Uh, actually, um, if you speak for the United States, I don't think that, I think it's only a small proportion, but I think the cartoonists in South Africa, are, are, they tend to be relatively, I mean, most of us, are, are, I think, are fairly progressive minded and we're, that's the sort of stuff we're doing. Our favorite trouble causes. Nanda Subban, what's the role of a political cartoonist anywhere in the world? Um, when I was growing up as a kid, and when I watched the cartoons in the, in, the, in the Daily News and the Mercury, they were basically gag cartoons. I remember Jock Layton was a great cartoonist, and he was a great cartoonist attacking Hitler during the war. I actually bought all his manuscripts in the auction, and they were really great cartoons. But during apartheid, I found that he didn't challenge the status quo. He, his uh, politics was the United Party, the Progressive Party, and the National Party. But there was a bigger story that things that outside that uh, and he didn't tackle it and then on June 16 I, in his book his cartoon on June 16 was about the sardine run in the Durban July um, and when I became the cartoonist of the Daily News I actually replaced uh, Jock Layden when he passed away and I took a lot of flack because people were accusing me of not doing enough funny cartoons they were so used to cartoons that made people laugh and I was actually tackling issues that were important. And I think most cartoons during apartheid, the mainstream newspapers, uh, the so-called white cartoonists did not tackle the issues. Mm -hmm. Interesting perspective there. Just a reminder from our audience to our panelists to please mute your, uh, your Zoom. If you're not actually speaking, you can unmute it when you are, just so we don't hear the background noise. I think people are quite... Uh, enjoying this conversation. Let's move from uh, Nanda Subin to Bethwell Mangena. What's the role of a political cartoonist, Bethwell, anywhere in the world? You need to unmute yourself, Bethwell, just uh, unmute. Yes. Okay. Uh, our role, we are activists. We fight for human rights. And also our duty is to inform the public about critical political and social issues and make sure that people are aware about what's happening in the country. I can be able to do a cartoon that can spark some kind of a, a revolution, you know, against a corrupt, uh, Absolutely, spark a revolution, something meaningful that makes a difference and it gets people to laugh, it gets people to feel <laughs> we're on the right track. Okay, we were waiting for Stacey to log back in, but let's move over to, over to Carlos. Carlos, what's the role of a political cartoonist anywhere in the world? Unmute, Carlos. Um, I agree totally with, with Rapira and Bethel's uh, summaries of it. Um, but I, there's, a, there's a sort of an issue about, about cartoonists as, as informers. I, I, I'm, I'm bothered by that sometimes because a cartoon is inevitably reductionist, reductive. Um, it kind of summarizes 
complex issues into simple narratives. And that, that is an important role. Um, but um, I think that the paradox of cartooning in a way is, is that it, it uh, gets, gets a reader to kind of summarize in his own mind or her own mind what the, the, the nub of an issue is. But there are many nubs and many readers. So it's a, it's a very complicated job. Um, but I think the main thing is to is to, um, to unsettle people, to console people by giving them a, a, a kind of an image of what they're thinking um, and to amuse, obviously. So comfort the disturb and disturb the comfortable. That's what I understand our political cartoonists to do and do it absolutely yeah. well. Um, so, so related to that particular question, what role did cartoonists play during apartheid compared to the role that you are playing now during democracy, Zapiro? Yeah, well, actually, there, there are three of us on this panel who were very much uh, working during apartheid and were all very strong anti-apartheid uh, activists. I mean, there's Nanda and Stacy and myself who go back, we all go back to, to, to that. And as, as Nanda said, there were, I, I mean, I felt I was in some ways the only, um, I mean, other than State, perhaps Stacey and I were, were the only ones who were really working in organizations, cartoonists who were, who were, could consider ourselves activists as well, the only white cartoonists, I mean, um, because there were, there were many others who were prepared to do this sort of, even some very, very powerful cartoons, but they didn't really get into, into advocacy. In those days, I felt, I felt very comfortable being an ideologue. I felt I had an ideology. Uh, it was anti-apartheid. It was pro-ANC, it was pro-United Democratic Front. And I was quite happy to push those lines. Uh, I think when things changed in, in, in the democracy, um, uh, beginning of democracy, I felt, I, I felt it I was able to detach slightly and become more of a commentator uh, than I had been before. Um, so, but I, but I still at heart have that kind of activism. Uh, and then I think things shifted again when, when I saw how corrupt things became, uh, I then found myself a real adversary of, you know, the, the government that I had absolutely supported. And I think now, you know, I think it's more like cartoonists all over the world pointing out uh, corruption, commentating, trying to give insights to, to, to people, trying to help people, uh, to make people laugh as, 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 as other people have said. But it's, I think our role is now more like the role of cartoonists all over the world. Um, and I've, you know, it's been through a number of shifts to get here. Sure, absolutely. All right, uh, let's move to uh, Nanda Subban. Same question. What role do cartoonists play during apartheid compared to the role that you play now during democracy? Um, I was going to say that uh, Zapiro uh, was one of the first white cartoonists who actually tackled the, uh, tackled the government uh, apartheid. Because I, I, even though Jocelyn was a brilliant cartoonist, and then there was uh, Robin and the Mercury, they did not tackle the issues of uh, apartheid and group areas act and things like that, which we, we, we actually suffered. We needed someone out there to speak out against it. I think the Piro is probably the only one who did that. Uh, and I did that, but I, I used to be called me cartoonist. Uh, but my cartoon was seen more as activism than, than cartoony, because I was just tackling the situation. And only when I, when I came back into the new South Africa, I started working like a cartoonist. Before that, it was just like being on the attack, just attacking the system and uh, tackling uh, the CLEC and PW Bota and things like that, which got me into a lot of trouble. And a lot of that actually hasn't changed because our cartoonists are having to continue that role as a vanguard of democracy, but you're using your creative skills to tell a thousand words in one picture because people don't want to read a thousand word essay. Uh, Bethel Mangena, tell us, um, what do you see as the difference in the role that cartoonists played during apartheid to the role that you're playing now during democracy? We'll have to unmute and put your camera back on Mangena.
bring uh, um, apartheid uh, cartoonists did their Okay, unmute yourself, Mangena. I think it's the first time he's using that app. So well done on being able to use the Zoom app for the first time. It can be a bit tricky. Just click on the mic so you can unmute yourself. There we go. And then click on the video button so we can see you. All right, I think we can see you, Mangena. You've muted yourself again, so we're going to have to come back to you. Uh, what we're we going to do now, we're about uh, at 7.30 p.m., uh, one third of the way through our brilliant program this evening, brought to you by I'm for the Arts and a wonderful uh, panel of cartoonists. We're going to be screening a documentary called The Mighty Pen which was produced by Four Rooms Entertainment. And I want to thank Carlejo and uh, Isabella for sending us this trailer uh, for this. Uh, for this uh, but before we do that, I want to ask a question why, while Yvette queues up the documentary trailer. It's about three minutes and 25 seconds. Before we screen it, I want to ask the audience a question, right? South Africans love laughing. It's how we cope with living in this beautiful, insane, tragic country called South Africa, Azania, Mzansi, whatever you want to call it. And we love cartoons. That's that's a fact. We see the debates. We see the comments. Every time there's a comment out there, people are sharing um, sharing the uh, cartoons across their social network pages, and it's fantastic. So here's a question for the audience: Why do you find the art of cartooning a powerful and often funny form of journalism? I saw a comment on Zapiro's page answering that question, saying that uh, because cartoons speak a thousand words in one picture. But let's see what our audience has to say. Why do you love cartoons? Let's see your comments and uh, we'll be reading them out during this conversation. We're gonna go now to the trailer of a documentary called The Mighty Pen featuring South African cartoonists. Having a slight technical difficulty with the audio on this trailer, and is, uh, Yvette can just let us know. Yeah, comments telling us they're looking for the audio. I'm not sure if it's the trailer or it's our lovely uh, Zoom system. 
Yeah, unfortunately, it's sharing computer sound. I can see that it's sharing computer sound, but it doesn't seem to be going through for some reason. All right, I think it's going to be a bit strange to. Uh, difficulty with the audio on this trailer, and it's, uh, it's going to be a bit strange to watch this. Uh, so let's let's exit this one. Um, and what we'll do is, is is share it to the I'm for the Arts group uh, during the course of this week. So you can have a look at this trailer of the documentary called The Mighty Pen by Four Rooms Entertainment. Thank you again to Katlejo and Isabella. It's going to be screening at our film festivals. So go and watch it. Hopefully Durban gets to show it first. Uh, no prejudice there. But at the Durban International Film Festival, Ismail Mohammed, if you're watching, that's where we'd love to screen it first. All right. We've got a, two questions here. Musa Klachwayo at uh, Mangena. Mangena, the question for you. Would you describe Gudusa and many other cartoons we see mostly in black media, um, particularly those that use vernacular language in the same line as how you've just beautifully described the role of a cartoonist? It would seem to me that in black media, uh, cartoonists continue to lose their political edge, social commentary, and any association with political activism. Great question there. Uh, Musa, would you agree, Betwa? Uh, can, can you please repeat the question again? Absolutely. So Musa Klachwayo's question is, would you describe Gudusa and many other cartoons we see mostly in black media? Uh, can, can, you you use... can you hear me, Betwa? I think you can also read the question on the chat. But Musa is asking about cartoons like Gudusa in black media. <laughs> And he's saying that, you know, it, it seems to him that in black media, cartoonists lose their political edge and social commentary and political activism. Would you agree? Okay, we're having uh, network issues there with Mangena. If you're using Wi-Fi, it helps if you're a little bit um... closer to it. Okay, definite issues there with Betwa. Well, we've got another question uh, from Ismail Mohammed, and he says, the attack on Charlie Hebdo in Paris was by religious fundamentalists. The progressive world stood up and advocated for free expression, but we do know that a significant number of cartoonists began to tread carefully about how they portrayed fundamentalist Islam. One of the strongest advocates for free speech was the New York Times, yet in 2015, the New York Times decided to stop publishing political cartoonists after a furor about the way its cartoonists depicted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Our editors bowing down to censorship from the religious left and right of all religious persuasions. All right, who wants to take that one? I'll take it on if that's all right. Yes, Carlos? Um, yeah, I think it's a very good question. And um, I think um, perhaps the New York Times is not the most uh, representative of free speech platforms. Um, you know, they have always had a sort of fairly uncomfortable relationship recently with, with political cartoons um, because they try to be a newspaper of record and, and, to, and to kind of be as neutral as they possibly can. But, but that's changing too. Um, but I think, I think cartoons are under threat. Um, and I think Steve Bell's contract has not been renewed at The Guardian, which is a sign of a, of a kind of a chilling mood there with regard to cartoons. So I think the... The, the absolute freedom to to speak by cartoonists is being challenged, and that's a that's a worrying step. All right, Zapiro, you had can a I, comment there. Now, just say yeah. something. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. Stacey, okay. Let's go with Stacy. I see Stacy is back. Yes, please. No, no, no. I, I, I this 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 cartoon very well, and in fact, it, there's no way it was an anti-Semitic cartoon. It was it was anti-Netanyahu, and what really disappointed me was that there was very little response from other cartoonists. I think they sort of said, well, you know, I think it was Antonio, wasn't it, that did that cartoon? Um, and uh, it, was, it, was, it, was not, it was not an anti-Semitic cartoon and it was being, it was being shown or, or described as such. And I think there's just a huge lobby to actually just have cartoonists hands off 
anything to do with Israel. And, and I think it's a real shame that cartoonists, I tried from this end to get, um, to get people to, uh, you know, especially the pro-Palestinian people, but everybody seemed to be just busy with other things. And I suppose so, so was I, so it just never, it never happened. But I think, I think as cartoonists, we really, really need to stand against that kind of thing. Um, you know, Powerful just, comment yeah, there from a joint, a joint effort, yeah. A joint effort. So you're saying cartoonists that stand together will be able to resist the censorship uh, of ideas and ideology. Zapiro, your comment? Yeah, um, but as, as it happens, uh, Stacy and I have, are both, uh, we're both veteran cartoonists, but we also happen both to be Jewish and we both happen to be very um, pro-Palestinian rights and, pro, and anti what the state of Israel has been doing um, and the anti the, the, the sort of the, the Zionist lobby. Um, so speaking for, my, for myself, you know, Stacy and I discussed this. I was also amazed that there was far more discussion about what happened after that, where, where Shepard's cartoon, Shepard's a good friend of mine and a fantastic cartoonist. I think he's a brilliant cartoonist, but he was, his cartoons were in the New York, the New York Times. And the idea of the New York Times, to, to, to agree with Carlos as well, that the, the, the New York Times is not the most representative thing of, of real, real free speech or whatever. I, I really don't think it, it is. The New York Times has been a gatekeeper on cartoons actually, because when, when I was studying in New York in 1988 and 89, I was amazed to realize for the first time, we were pretty isolated in those days, but to, to find that the New York Times was the only major newspaper that did not have an editorial cartoon. I asked the editor of the yeah. um, New York Review of uh, Books, the, 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 the pictures editor, and he said, you're not going to like this answer. The New York Times considers itself to be too influential to have one person be the cartoonist. I mean, that the, all the great newspapers of the world can do it except the New York Times. Right. And I thought that was unbelievably arrogant. And what happened was that Shepard kind, kind of came in via the back door when the New York Times sort of bought the, the, the International Her Herald Tribune. And then his cartoons appeared. And the moment there was any serious controversy, and it was, as usual, it was about an issue of the Middle East, and it was the, the, the kind of the lobby that sort of got on, on the New York Times' case for publishing a cartoon that I thought was, I mean, I agree with Stacey, it was absolutely not, nothing wrong with the cartoon. Um, I'm, I, there may have been nuances I would have done differently had I done that cartoon, but that cartoon was always very much in the realm of, of, of free speech uh, and, of, and, and I didn't think there was anything seriously wrong with it at all. Uh, but all right. the, people went nuts about uh, Shapat mm -hmm. getting pulled, but not as crazy about that. People did not activate as much against uh, the, the, the original uh, decision by the New York Times on, the, on that cartoon. Uh, All right. I want to get a view from Nanda Subban on that one, because I know you've done <laughs> quite a few cartoons of Ariel Sharon and Benjamin Netanyahu. And then Yvette, Cur Curtis tells us that the gray button is turned down and people want to see. He says the audio is on zero on the gray control panel. We do want to watch uh, that documentary. So Yvette, if you can sort that out, that would be great. We'll take some comments in a bit. But first, a comment from Nanda Subban on censorship related I, I to particular to speak ideologies. Speak about religion, not, not, not anti-Semites or about Palestinian or Israel, but similar to that. Uh, in January, I was invited to the Indian consulate to celebrate the, the Independence Day. They invited me for the last 20, 20 years. And then a few days before the, the function, they sent me an email telling me that I was they were withdrawing the invitation. That's because I picked on Modi, for Modi for attacking Muslims in India. And I, uh, my family are Hindus, but India is a secular country and we are proud of that secular, secularism of India. Everyone's so proud of that. And yet Modi was trying to turn it into a Hindu state and I was picking on that. And because of that, I received a lot of uh, insults from people, people who uh, come from the same community as me. Um, and I just want to say that when we do cartoons, it's about what's right and what's wrong. It's not about which, which ethnic group you support. That's not. I've done cartoons on Zuma, and I've done cartoons on Trump. 
And then the issues have been the same. Corruption, uh, nepotism, stupidity, uh, misogyny, everything, the, the same thing. But the yeah. Zuma, the, 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 some people would love my cartoons because I pick on Zuma, but the same people would not like me because I pick on Trump. But the issues right. are the same. That's, that's that's a very interesting uh, hypocrisy almost that they're okay when you pick on Zuma, they're not okay when you pick on Trump. I find that to be very interesting. A comment from Curtis uh, Williams, cartoonists must stand together with all forms of art to make sure that it's a broad group of artists who fight for the same freedoms. Valuable point there. Uh, comments by Cinda Etox, Zapiro, you are very smart and hilarious. Frank Menkes, thanks Nanda, great example, very current. All right, Musa has uh, reframed his question. If I can just direct it at Stacy, because I don't know if Mangena can hear us. Stacy, uh, Musa was asking about cartoonists. Uh, Mangena, can you hear us now? If you can just indicate, because I think it's about vernacular language cartoons, and you might be better placed to answer that one. How's your network? Uh, can you hear me now? Because I can nice hear and, you. Yeah, that's nice and clear, but there's just a bit of a delay. So the question was about vernacular language. Uh, cartoons in vernacular newspapers. Um, that's the question that Musa was asking about because he says that when these cartoons are published in vernacular language newspapers, they lose that activism and political advocacy feel. Do you agree? Uh, I, I don't agree because I think uh, as cartoonists, we must be able to cater for different audiences. So we must not stay because we are used to having cartoons done in English. Then we ignore the vernacular languages. That's what we cartoons are there for. So we can be able to draw our people to understand cartoons and start following this um, kind of art. So, so speak to your audience. Stacey, would you agree? Do we Are we losing political activism in certain vernacular newspapers or do you think it's just about the audience? I, I, I don't know. It might even be about sort of self-censorship. Um, I, I, I don't understand why. I've not experienced that myself. I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, very fluent, but uh, you know, when I do understand or when things are translated for me, I haven't seen you know, it depends on right. the I don't, I don't see that there's been a loss of, of the point being made or mm -hmm. the criticism or whatever, yeah. All right, thanks for that one, Musa. Curtis says, Nanda spoke the truth right there. People are oblivious as to how their qualms are connected across the oceans. All right, Yvette, let's give it a go to screen the Mighty Pen documentary trailer by Forums Entertainment featuring some of South Africa's best cartoons. Somehow in the euphoric kind of context of the, of the Rainbow Nation narrative, that anything goes period was allowed to survive and a lot of incredible art came out of South Africa but some of it was extremely transgressive. But we say the time has come for everybody to know his place. The time has come for every oppressed person of this country to say we say no more. buy the paper and, and read to do it. And even that I thought was normal, but other people didn't read. My other friend didn't read the paper, or they couldn't read. And the newspapers were very white. I felt like I was really in a very, very small group of people who really felt that things were radically wrong. A cartooning has given me a release. Like, like I said earlier, I was not, I've never been a, a vocal guy. So this has given me a release to 
speak my truth to the world out there. How the world receives it, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure. But the thing is, I have said it. It's interesting that the reason why you can't do it anymore is not because the authorities say you can't do it, it's because you get killed on public, on, on social media. Social media gives a platform for people to enforce a new kind of democratic conformism, a new set of taboos, I think the pair used that phrase, to suddenly start controlling what is, 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 is allowed in the media. All right, that's the Mighty Pen documentary by Four Rooms Entertainment, and we're hoping to see it at our film festivals and, of course, mainstream cinema as well to understand the role of our cartoonists in our democracy, taking us from apartheid to where we are now. I thought it was absolutely brilliant and a good idea of things to come. So well done to everybody that's featured uh, in that documentary. What we're going to do next is we're going to screen some of your cartoons, and you're going to pick one of them to take us through from motivation to concept. Uh, our audience, if you're feeling inspired, you can sketch a caricature or a cartoon too at the hashtag I'm for the arts and we will post your cartoon up on the I'm for the arts group. Or if you don't feel like drawing, you could just vote for one of your favorite cartoons that you see on screen in the live video comments. All right, let's screen some of those cartoons. All right, Zapira, which one are you going to speak to? Zapira, if you can hear us, I'm not sure if you may be on mute. Hi. I think I was on, I think I was muted. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, the, 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 the large one on the color one on, on Trump, uh, just mm -hmm. a few cartoons back. Um, the, I, yeah, I've been obviously any, any progressive minded person around the world, uh, whether or not you live in the United States, is, must be utterly shocked that this monster is the most powerful person in the world. It's it's beyond belief. So obviously I've done many, many, many things on Trump. And I naively thought that there would be some effect on him uh, from his, I, I, I realized that he was going to get through the kind of impeachment stuff. Uh, and then I thought that because the Republican Party has sort of decided that they, they're going with him, even though they know how flawed he is, they know how transgressive he is, they know how actually unintelligent the guy is and they know how, how deeply reactionary he is but I thought that COVID-19 would would start to impact on him earlier this year when he lied and when he ignored it and all that appeared not to have much of an impact then everything shifted with 
Black Lives Matter, when George Floyd, uh, um, Black Lives Matter had certainly started long before this, but when George Floyd was murdered by police uh, and in such a, a graphic way, like with a knee on his neck, it, the symbol was so powerful that I, I thought, and Trump's response was so, it was so appalling and so unempathetic and so brutal and so uh, dictatorial that I, I felt I wanted to try and bring all of these things into one cartoon. So mm -hmm. the, the, the idea of the knee uh, be, be, and, and Trump on George Floyd, uh, I was not the only cartoonist who did that. Other people did that too. I felt though that I wanted to really tap into an image that I've always thought is one of the most powerful images ever created by any artist and that's Goya, the great mm -hmm. Spanish uh, artist Goya who did Saturn devouring the various names for it. He did a few different versions. Saturn, Saturn uh, the, the, the Roman god, devouring his offspring. And I thought I would bring the knee, George Floyd, I can't breathe. It's, I still get choked up even thinking about this. And then I put a COVID-19 uh, um, victim under the other knee because of mm. Trump's response to that. And, and also many of the, 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 proportionately there were much higher, there's a much higher proportion of African American and, and minority, uh, well, American minority um, victims of, of COVID-19. So that's why that seemed appropriate. And then of course, ripping the whole of the, of the United States is represented by the Statue of Liberty. And then Trump of course had done that crazy, disgusting uh, uh, photo op with the Bible which is why the Bible hides his genitals. And he'd pulled in not only police, but even army, kind of stormtroopers behind him. And the United States was burning uh, the biggest riots since 1968. So for me, it was all just, everything all came together in this one parody of a, of a great uh, uh, Spanish artist of, of Goya's um, Saturn devouring his offspring. Absolutely brilliant. Curtis Williams says, Zapiro, please do Chief Zionist. And I think I know what he's talking about. And you have, there it is right there, Chief Zionist, Mokhu, Mokhueng, 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 ancient myth, modern reality. All right. Thanks, Zapiro. Let's move on to Nanda Subin. Uh, and he's going to look at six of his cartoons and he's going to speak to one of them simply from motivation to concept in a minute. So we've got sports cartoons, we've got Hashim Amla. We've got Herschel Gibbs being a quota player when he's off form. We've got gender-based violence and the racism all in one. Uh, we've got Trump falling over the edge. We've got Zuma falling over the edge. And the last one, the most recent, Black Lives Matter, arguing with All Lives Matter. All right, Nanda Subin, which cartoon would you like to take us through from motivation to concept? I think you might be on mute if I can't hear you. You're on mute. You need to unmute the mic. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll speak about the Eshel Gibbs cartoon. I didn't see it coming up though. Um, but that's not the cartoon that I want to speak about. But I want to speak about Eshel Gibbs. Um, when Eshel Gibbs was a youngster, schoolboy, he was the best sportsman in South Africa. I want to, not this cartoon, but uh, I want to speak about Eshel Gibbs. Um, this comes up his career in South Africa as a, as a brilliant cricketer. Um, when he was a schoolboy, under 19, he was the under 19 South African cricket captain. He was a South African rugby captain at under 19. He could have played for the Springboks at Flyer. He could have played for Bafana, Bafana football. Um, he was so brilliant um, as a cricketer and uh, as a rugby player. And then suddenly, no one, when Ansi Kronier became captain of the approach, yards, no one heard of the actual kids. He was scoring a lot of runs in Cup kind of cricket. And people were asking, why isn't the actual kids being picked? And then I did a cartoon for the Independent on Saturday. I drew actual kids. Uh, standing full on, uh, just looking, uh, holding his bat and uh, looking at uh, my caption read, when Ashley Gibbs, uh, 
I, I wrote down everything that I just spoke about now, about him being the captain of all the school schoolboy team. And then I said, maybe they realized that he wasn't white and they stopped picking him. And the, that cartoon went into the Independent on Saturday. And a week later, Asher Gibbs was picked for the Pro Girls uh, after a lot of pressure. And then he made five or, or a few runs. And he was picked as an opening batsman. As an opening batsman, you have to face the new ball. And he struggled against the new ball because he was basically a middle order batsman. And then the lady found the, the paper. And, and then the editor put a through to me. And she said, you see, affirmative action doesn't, she, she actually took off with me, she for me, she used a lot of languages. And she said, uh, affirmative action doesn't work. And that should give went on to become one of the greatest batsmen in this country. Um, Certainly a brilliant that, example there. Certainly a brilliant example there of how civil society advocacy and pressure, including that from cartoonists, make such a massive difference. Of course, yeah. the, the, the phone call was not very pleasant there. Comment from Rashida Khan. Mr. Subin is tr truly gifted such incisive, thought-provoking commentary. We've got 30 minutes to go in this absolutely brilliant webinar. We're certainly enjoying it. We've got another challenging question from Ismail Mohammed. Just after we do the screening of these cartoons, I want to turn now to Stacey Stent. Let's have a look at your cartoon, Stacey. Which one would you like to speak to from motivation to concept? So I apologize, it's Mangena first, apologies. Uh, Mangena's cartoons are here. So we've got government corruption and more corruption and the UIF TERS issue at the Department of Labor where the taps are running dry. And we've got Zimbabwe. Just before that we had uh, COVID-19, all right. Bethwell, which cartoon would you like to take us through from motivation to concept? Mangena, can you hear us? Here we go. Use this one when there is uh, for the first time, the schools be open. The, the, the government announced that they will be able to. Yeah, for the first time, the government yes. announced that they are going to reopen schools. Um, like the first, yes, the first one for me was. Keep going, Yvette. Almost how there. How are kids going to. Yeah, for the first time, the government announced that. Uh, how are they going to uh, uh, wear masks? Before that, the first one for me was, that's the one. How are yes. So for me, um, I thought of this idea that for the maybe for the, so for me, um, I thought of this idea that like the. Okay, I can't hear Bethwell right now, but just back on that COVID-19 classroom uh, cartoon, a really powerful one there, but what would happen when the children go back to school? And it's exactly what happened, isn't it? Uh, children really struggled. Masks. Um, yes. Uh, um, so I know, like, I could just imagine. Uh, um, so I know, like, I could just imagine wearing the mask all over, like, on their foreheads. Some chasing themselves, you know. Some, uh, you know, some. Uh, uh, what's, uh, what's happening in some schools? Mm. I must say, I love that touch about Mist. He says, my mask is cheap because certainly that's an issue even if our classrooms between the haves and the yeah. have not. Yeah. Yes, we're really struggling with your network though, Bethwell. Yeah. Bring the mask. 
Okay, we're going to have to leave it there with Mangena, but he'll be able to comment. Yeah, I think on uh, the, uh, the area where I stay, the network is very bad, but mm -hmm. I can quickly try to. Can you hear me? Yeah, Mangena, it's breaking up. So what we'll do is you'll comment on the live video after the show and take us. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the area the where I stay. The motivation to concept. I understand perfectly fine. Let's move there to Stacey Stens for cartoons, Yvette. That's the first one. So the first one was the ANC political party struggle. The second one is uh, Trump and Netanyahu. The third one is police brutality in Plele. And the last one is a comparison between the violence in America by the police state and the violence in South Africa. Stacey, which one would you like to take us through motivation to concept? I think the one just before this, the police brutality one. Uh, with, with, with Becky clearly, yeah. Okay. Um, th th this, what happened when I was doing, these were all part of a series of, you can call them cartoons or posters or cartoon posters that I did, that I was first um, motivated to do um, in, uh, you know, as we will all remember, shortly after um, the beginning of the lockdown, uh, that Collins Causa was, was murdered by uh, SANDF um, uh, soldiers who actually invaded his home and, and dragged him outside and killed him there. And uh, I was absolutely flabbergasted by the lack of comment and the lack of movement uh, from, uh, from our leadership. And uh, I even had to struggle to, 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 to find Colin Causa's name. They didn't even publish his name uh, at, at first. They just said that, that a man had died at the hand, and then it turned out at the hands of the SANDF. And when I found his name, I did my first poster, which was motivated by um, uh, the, the spokesperson for the SANDF, Simpuiwe um, Dlamini, uh, uh, saying, uh, when he was asked this by an interviewer, you know, what are the feelings of, of, of the SNDF? And he said, well, you know, sometimes our, our boys just get a bit excited. And I just could not believe that response. So I did the, cart the cartoon, the one that you saw actually at the end of, this, of, of the showing, um, showing uh, Collins Causa uh, being beaten up and, and, and saying, and, and a little sort of picture of, of Damini in the corner. Uh, with that quote. Uh, then George Floyd happened, so I paralleled the two cartoons. And still, I, I found that even when the government was sort of asked about the Black Lives Matter, they, they were fairly dismissive. And that's what promoted me doing this cartoon, where Becky Trele actually, I think, I think it was somebody in, in the Big Six, I think who it was, somebody in the Big Six wanted to, um, Jessie Duarte, that's right, she wanted to make a, some, some remembrance out of Black Lives Matter. And Becky Trele uh, was opposed to it. He said that it's not relevant in, in, our, in our country. And I just, I just found all these things you know, were coming together and I was drawing away. And so that's what resulted in this, car this cartoon. So what I did was I went into iPad and I did a lot of research on all the atrocities that have been committed by uh, police during, uh, you know, across the last few years and, and put them as medals on his chest because he's always busy with his chest out and his stomach in. And that's what, <laughs> that's what resulted in, in, in this particular picture. Powerful cartoon there from Stacey Stent. I was about to say a lot of research that went into that one and cartoonists know it's not, not just about being a right-brained creative, it's about being a left-brained thinker as well who does the research and needs to know your facts. All right, let's move from there to Carlos Amato and uh, his six cartoons. The first one is the state capture inquiry, the Zondo Commission, all the skeletons popping out, yes. And then we've got Dilute. And I love this one because it speaks to who's behind the curtain of corruption. The next one is the IMF. Uh, your, my wish is your command, so relevant right now. Tito Mboweni there. The next one is 
AOC, topical and relevant, and speaking to the misogyny. And then we've got, uh, we don't have an energy crisis, we've got a political and systemic crisis, right, ESCOM? And that's the last one. It's uh, Praveen trying to resuscitate the SAA. It's not dead, it's resting. All right, Carlos, which one would you like to take us to from motivation to concept? I'll talk about the most recent one, which is the AOC cartoon. AOC, and I think that's two back, Yvette. That's the one. That's it. Yeah, so um, this one was uh, almost taking a break from, uh, from all our traumatic local news and uh, <laughs> dipping into the traumatic American culture war. Um, and I've always wanted to try and get into uh, doing more uh, detailed watercolor caricature, which this is a early experiment in and I'm really enjoying it. Um, and, you know, this, this speech that she gave to Congress was, uh, was really like powerful and affecting. And, and I just thought this, this showdown between this sort of representative of of this ugly, ugly side of of, uh, of American politics as a, as a kind of pathetic fly being swatted away by AOC was a way of expressing the kind of relative values of their positions. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I think it was a, it was a simple um, idea, which I often struggle to achieve. Uh, you know, I always try and pack too much into a cartoon. And this one I think was, was economical and uh, fun to draw. And uh, I'm starting to finally get that you know, of, of caricature, which is just such a, such a fun thing to do, to, to pick a feature and expand it and, and, and achieve a likeness, um, which I think this, this did achieve, so I'm happy. I think everything here, Carlos, from the composition to the concept to the messaging to her expressions is absolutely on point. I do hope you get to tweet it to her. I think a lot of people are doing carto cartoons on AOC and I think she'd love to see them. Such a lovely range. I mean, such a powerful range of cartoons, diverse topics, right? We've had Zapiro with Trump and Black Lives Matter. Uh, and then we've had uh, sports, uh, which is very topical and relevant right now with the debacle at the CSA with Nanda Subban. We've had the COVID-19 lockdown and highlighting inequality with Beth Mangena. We've had police brutality and state brutality with Stacey Stent. And we've had misogyny and sexism and the patriarchy, which AOC is standing up against in, uh, in America. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Cartoon. There's a comment here from Yvonne Shapiro. I just love the classroom cartoon. It has certainly circulated everywhere. That one's for you. Uh, Mangen, I hope you can still hear us, and I think we're going to have to keep your video off so that we can uh, we can at least hear you on the audio. All right. Question from Ismail Mohammed: For donkey's years, it has been the job of an editorial cartoonist to use the newspaper as a platform to expose hypocrisies and abuses of politicians and powerful institutions. Nowadays, with social media, anyone with a keyboard creates satirical and political memes within minutes of any event or incident or political speech. Are we going to see the extinction of the editorial cartoonist in the same way as we've seen the demise of arts journalists? All right, who wants to take that one? I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, that's the reason that you're gonna see the, the, the demise of, of political cartoons. I, I, I think that the problem is uh, um, that uh, print media is radically under threat and so traditional in traditional media I think cartooning is under threat there are people who are uh, so both because of the, the change in change in media and the way that the newspapers are sort of disappearing <coughs> traditional media there's that and then also there is the, the other question that we started to look at earlier the the, the way that I think editors are um, are, are Think that, are centering uh, and are are putting pressure and are being pressured by other people. They 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 actually they, they I think that some editors in various parts of the world are losing sight of that fantastic convention of free speech that cartoonists have have had. I think the idea the one other thing that I do think is very interesting in Islam Muhammad's question here is that the, with the, with the memes and the way that they happen so quickly on social media. I think sometimes if cartoonists try and compete with those, we can be behind the curve because they happen 
instantaneously. So in a way, we've got to do what we're best at, which is actually to interrogate things a little bit further and from a, a more oblique point of view. And you know, occasionally we can do exactly what they do, but sometimes we've got to do what cartoonists have traditionally been very good at, which is to come from a real sort of curveball angle and, and actually really interrogate things in, in, a, in a more in-depth way. More in-depth interrogation. Any comments from Stacey, Carlos, <laughs> Nanda, or Bitwell on that question? Will social media kill off cartooning? Um, okay. Go. So we go with Stacey first. Uh, yeah. I was just saying I'm 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 a, a, a big fan of Anne Telmeas, who is a very very um, uh, strong and 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 and, and well-publicized American cartoonist. And she, uh, in, in a recent talk, has been saying she's, you know, that, that print media is, you know, curtailing a, a, a lot of cartoonists. And she's stepping back and she's actually gone. She's, she's a very, very fine cartoonist and a very fine uh, uh, artist. And she's stepping into animation. And she's got a sharp, sharp head and, and a very, very critical one. And, and her animations are very short. They're, they're sometimes only a few seconds. But I think they're getting quite a lot of um, life online. But that's, you know, look, she's very well known already. And she's, and she's, uh, but I think maybe, maybe online cartooning is going to have to be, you know, the answer. I mean, I, I don't want to sort of see us fade away because print media is, is, is fading away. All right. Thank you for that, Stacey, bringing in some insight there uh, with regards to animation and cartooning. Nanda Subban. I think uh, the thing about cartoons, they, they cannot be censored because when an idea comes, you take it to the editor and he tells you, oh, you're going to make a change. When you make a change, you kill the punchline. You cannot change a punchline. The moment you change it, you kill it. Um, the thing is, when you are doing online cartoons on, on your own, you can do whatever you want. And cartoonists are real. They, we are not governed by editorship or the owners of the newspapers. But when we work for them, we have to stick to what they want us to do. I, I did, uh, there was a newspaper that I worked for. Uh, they would want to give me the idea and ask me to draw. It does not work like that. The only way you can do real good cartoons is if you do it for yourself and you, and you make your own thoughts visual through your cartoons. That's when you can see the real good cartoons. If you're governed by the, the, the scared, the, the, the people who are really frightened of losing the job are the editors. They're so scared of the people who own the newspapers. I had so many problems with editors. It's just not funny. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality. A comment from Curtis Williams. Cartooning cannot be killed by social media because memes will persist, but memes cannot kill cartooning because there's a different value to cartoons. Comment from Mikhail Pepas, amazing insights presented through wondrous and diverse drawing styles. All right, Carlos, any comments on that? Can social media kill cartooning? No, I mean, I agree. I agree with, with what the others have said. Um, I do think that, that, that Zapira's point about not trying to compete with memes is very important. Um, it's fun to compete. It's fun to get involved in that kind of churn. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, um, we have to deliver something meteor. Mangana, can you hear us? Any comments on that question? Can social media kill cartooning? I think there's no way uh, social media can uh, kill cartooning because there's no creative thought behind. And you can't uh, take a meme and think that you can keep it uh, to make uh, historical references. But with a cartoon, it has a very strong message that you can carry on for future generations to teach them about what was actually happening during that time. So social media can kill cartooning. Social media can't kill cartooning. All right, uh, Yvonne Shapiro says, Shadnam just answered that question. Actually, it was the cartoonist, but thanks, Yvonne. A resounding no. There will always be cartoonists doing research and making connections. I'm trying to find the comment from Catlejo on the uh, on the trailer of the documentary that we just 
screen and I'm not picking it up on the uh, Facebook live. Maybe Yvette, if you can find it and pop it into the chat, then we can read it out. I think that's important to acknowledge our filmmakers uh, as well as our cartoonists. All right, I want to move on from there to talk about um, corruption and, and being threatened, etc. So corruption and service delivery provide painfully brilliant cartoon content. And you as cartoonists would have less content if there was less corruption and more service delivery. One can always hope that that will happen in, in our lifetimes. Um, but do you agree in relation to corruption that art changes the world faster than politics? Have you seen those examples where you do a cartoon and corruption and you see the shift happening in the national psyche in terms of politics, in terms of investigations, in terms of actual impact? Uh, cartooning and corruption, tell us about some of the impact you've seen. Zapiro? You know, I, I think it would be very it'd be tempting to to give a very glib answer to this question but i mean really if you're trying to you know um it, it, it's it's so difficult to gauge cause and effect uh, mm -hmm. i think i think you can get you can sort of see it you can see whether you your own cartoons other people's cartoons have a following whether there's a discourse whether arguments happen whether certain things happen out but but generally speaking it's very difficult to say well that cartoon actually caused something to happen i mean you, mm. every now and then you see somebody like banksy who's become this sort of global phenomenon and banksy's doing a certain kind of cartooning and you can see the kind of impact that that, that gets made i mean i've had one or two cartoons that have gone huge what effect have they actually had who the hell knows i mean the, the strongest cartoon that i've ever had which is now on a list of 15 cartoons that changed the world. Um, yeah. It's a fairly credible list. Mine comes in number 15. It's the Rape of Justice cartoon, which I said before I will de I'll defend. I mean, what effect did that have? It, it helps to sort of galvanize a certain group of people. It helps to, to engage some people who might not engage on certain things, but who knows what actually happens. I'll tell you, there was one cartoon that I, there's one I can remember, which really appeared to have cause and effect. And that was a, a Kulikane Setoli, the, the Correctional Services uh, um, uh, Commissioner, who had the ridiculous idea of building prisons down disused mine shafts. And mm -hmm. I just like, I was so outraged by that idea that I did a cartoon of a, a disused mine shaft, uh, 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 him standing in front of a, a, um, a big uh, chart and showing a disused uh, diagram, disused mine shaft. Then I did his head with the same exact same thing with a little mind that said disused brain cavity. And mm. that that was on TV the next day. And, a, um, and the people who were showing it on TV was the this uh, prisoners for human rights, South African prisoners for human rights. And apparently I'm told <coughs> in political circles, he could never mention that idea again because he got laughed out of the room because people say, oh, he's got the disused brain cavity. So that's not one of those cartoons which had real cause and effect. But right, uh, and I, I remember that a few one. more, but not that many. Yeah, I remember that one. And we've got about six minutes to go with a brilliant, brilliant panel. So I'm going to shuffle up the questions. Nanda Subin, same question. Any one of your cartoons you feel had a ripple effect in fighting corruption? Yeah, uh, one of the cartoons that I actually paid a big price for that. Uh, the, the Zuma cartoon where I had a group dance putting a finger up Zuma's butt and Zuma giving us two fingers. Uh, the, that was, uh, I had my window shot. My school was broken into 16 Apple Macs were stolen. There were four break-ins. They took away my accreditation, my funding and everything. And the, the arts were actually investigating it. They picked up all the political innuendo that happened. But that case hasn't come about and I lost my accreditation for the school. Uh, they, well, I think you only got six minutes, but. This is the biggest story than six minutes. Right. Uh, Carla, since you're on the same screen, let me ask you that same question. Any one of your cartoons you feel have uh, rippled the, the tide against corruption? You're on mute, Carlos. Um, no, I doubt, I doubt I've had much of an effect, but uh, um, one of the cartoons that I did about corruption did uh, go viral and it was about uh, Zuma, being visited by the ghost of, of Gaddafi uh, uh, after there was Sunday Times report about how uh, he had smuggled Gaddafi's millions to Swaziland. And uh, 
So I had uh, Gaddafi visiting him in Kandla and saying, uh, Switzerland. I said, Switzerland, you idiot, not Swaziland. So <laughs> that, uh, that went, went well online. So maybe it had some effect on ridiculing Zuma, which is what we all want to do. Yep. Okay. Some comments here from Rashida Khan. Cartoonists play a critical role in putting our society, political, and even uh, even civil society under spotlight. Social media cannot replace that, even though it has to have its own role. Cynthia Ostinda uh, Etox says Banks is more graffiti. Is cartooning similar to graffiti? Is it really revolutionary? I think that's a topic for another time. Frank Menke is given the way in which memes respond fast as immediate news. Isn't there an opportunity for more work on inequality and capitalism and its impacts? especially in a highly unequal society, to make people think about things like health monopolies, food price increases, what top bosses pay themselves, et cetera. All right, let me have a look at the time. We are winding down very, very quickly. So I'm going to give the last two questions to Stacy and to Bethwell. Stacy, what's the industry like for cartoonists in terms of opportunity, sustainability, and growth? Well, at the moment, it's, it's at the moment it's a little bleak, but uh, I, I, you know, I think if you want to be a cartoonist, just you know, you just have to do it. You have to do. You don't. You don't have to confine yourself to paper. You don't have to confine yourself to, to uh, the screen. You can. You can do. You can do it on pavements. You can do it on walls. You, uh, you know, if you're a cartoonist and you want to express yourself in that way and comment on the world around you or society or politics, you know, there, there are ways to make it public and, and public art. And I think that, um, you know, the, the, the people who are sitting and wanting to be cartoonists shouldn't be disillusioned by the fact that, um, you know, well, things are tough at the moment, things are tough for every, everybody. But I think that they, they, they will, they can change things. They can change things by stretching it out. They can change things and they stand of the, on the shoulders of giants. Mangena, please unmute your mic. I want to ask you this question. What advice do you have for new cartoonists or people who want to be cartoonists in South Africa? Because it's it's not for the faint-hearted, right? Um, I'd advise uh, upcoming uh, cartoonists not to concentrate too much on working for newspapers. Because you can see with media organizations uh, closing down, newspapers closing down. So it's, um, it's very tough. So I advise them to explore the industry, find something um, uh, that they can uh, do to um, sustain themselves. I'm also working on a, a graphic novel. I've written um, a movie script and have um, two uh, storylines that we are still going to to finish. I'm hoping that maybe from that we can be able to get sponsors so we can be able to produce a movie in the near future. Because I can see like with the newspapers closing down, the future looks very uh, bleak. All right, so you've got to keep your eyes out for those opportunities to evolve as an artist and a cartoonist. And we're going to start rounding up here now with Katlejo's comment, Katlejo Shibambo from Four Rooms Entertainment, and shares the Mighty Pen documentary is coming soon. This is a beautiful panel. Salute, satirist, never stop. Can we give all of ourselves, all of you actually, a round of applause at this point for all of the work you do? You can, you can applaud for each other. Unmute your mic. We want to hear you clap. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much for, for being a part of this panel. And um, I want to say a massive... Thank you to our panelists, not only for making the time to be with us here today, but more so for dedicating your art form to inspiring and agitating us to want to build a better country. Thank you also to our viewers and to everybody who commented and provided such interesting feedback. We, we know without a doubt South Africans love cartoons. Remember to share this live video from the I'm for the Arts group to your pages. It will also be available on YouTube shortly so you can share the link with more people and look out for next week's Women's Month event focused on women CEOs in the creative space. Uh, for the I'm for the Arts group uh, and movement. Any last words? I can't even give you a minute to say any last words to any of our cartoonists. I do apologize for it at 8.30. But until we meet again on these stimulating online streets, 
Let's stay creative, compassionate, courageous, committed, and loyal to the power of the people. From I'm for the Arts Revolutionary Peace, Shabnam Palesa Muhammad. Good night. Bye, Good night. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shabnam.